Hey class, welcome to another video on medical terminology. Today we are in chapter 12, the eye. The eye is a pretty straightforward chapter. It's pretty short, so we're not gonna spend a whole lot of time on it, but I'm gonna show you uh, some images to help you better understand what some of these terms are meaning so that when you see them in the clinical facilities or the offices, you'll have a better understanding of what those things are. So the eye as we know it sits inside of the skull, inside of what we call the orbit, and that's just this section of bone around. There's actually a large component to the eye that is un that's not visible. It sits inside of the orbit behind that bony case, and only the small amount on the outside is actually visible. So here we see the anatomy of the eye, and you can see this uh, structure chart listed on page 517 and it's going to be a pretty important image of the eye it's discussing the anatomy the chart for this is on page 517 here is another visible surface structure of the eye and we'll be looking at this as we move through this chart on page 517 as well so the sclera is the outer eye portion and you can see here it's labeled in this image running all the way around the outer portion this is also what makes up the white of the eye as we see it over the visible portion of the eye. The cornea then is the transparent front section of the eye that allows light to actually come in through it. Here you can see down here on this bottom figure, it's kind of blown up a little bit. It shows you the corneal section. So up here you would be saying this is the cornea and that is the that outermost protective layer of the eye. The cornea is the transparent layer of the sclera. You can see the sclera coming back around here and then switching over to um, that transparency. Choroid is the middle layer of the eye that's actually got the blood vessels and supplies nutrients to it. So here you can see underneath the sclera, you have the choroid, list shown right here in, in blue. So that's what is actually providing the nutrients and the blood to the eye so that it can function properly. The iris itself is what gives your eye the color. So it's when you say, what color are your eyes? Uh, you're talking about the iris of it. It's actually a muscular type of structure that is able to close in and out kind of like a camera lens in order to let more light either in by dilating or keeping more light out by constricting. And here we can see the iris listed on this image this large blue aspect here is the iris. And then you note that it's on top and bottom. It's actually this component here on this picture that's brown. You can see the entire iris. So it's actually a complete round structure that's just going to either dilate or constrict. But looking at it here, you can see that this middle portion is actually completely absent. The pupil is actually just the hole inside of the iris. And we can see that on this image as well. The black pupil really isn't a thing itself. It's just the hole in the iris. You can see that well on this picture. So when you look through that iris, what you're actually looking then at is the lens. The lens lies directly behind the pupil and is what focuses and bends the light. So you can see here directly behind the pupil opening is the lens. That's going to bend and direct that light and ultimately shoot it back uh, to the back of the eye where it will be received by the retina, which is that innermost layer of the eye, and it contains the vision receptors. Then we have two uh, portions of the eye called the aqueous humor and the vitreous humor. So the aqueous humor, uh, we get the term aqua or aqueous from water. It's a watery liquid found in the anterior or front portion of the eye, and it provides nourishment and also helps maintain the shape of the eye. So here you can see we're pointing out the aqueous humor just underneath the cornea. And before you get to the iris, you've got this watery pouch up here that's giving us that convex shape of the eye. And that's that watery aqueous humor. The vitreous humor then is this jelly-like substance that makes up the majority of the eyeball. And it's found behind the lens in the posterior cavity of the eye and it helps maintain the shape of the overall eye as well. A few more anatomical structures of the eye. 
Uh, we look at a couple of glands and ducts. The mebomian glands are oil glands found in uh, the upper and lower edges of the eyes and of the eyelids to help lubricate. Lacrimal glands and ducts help uh, produce and drain the tears. And here we can see the lacrimal duct in the inside corner of the eye. The optic nerve is then what carries the visual impulses from the retina to the brain. And we could see that back here on this image again. Once it is received by the retina, then those visual images are being transferred to the brain via the optic nerve. So it's almost like an analog to digital conversion that takes place as we pass light through the eyeball back to the retina and the retina essentially receives that analog vision signal and then converts it to a digital signal to transmit it back to the eye via the optic nerve. And then the last one on this page is conjunctiva, which is the mucous membrane lining the eyelid. And this is oftentimes what we'll see gets inflamed uh, when we have pink eye. And uh, here you can see they're pointing it out sort of just as this general area or just sort of the area that's of the white of the eye or the sclera, but really you're, you're not going to see it until it gets inflamed. Down here is a better pointing out of the conjunctiva. It's this little tiny layer that's right here that covers that sclera. And then when that gets inflamed, uh, it'll get reddened and we'll start to, to see it become visible on uh, the outside of the cornea, which again is just that clear layer of the sclera that we mentioned earlier. Again, uh, here's one of those really nice pathways, images that I really enjoy. This one is the pathway of light through the eye. So we start with the light on the outside of the eye and it's going to pass through the cornea and then the aqueous humor as it then moves through the pupil. So that iris then remember is adjusting either opening or closing to let either more or less light in. So in a very bright situation, you walk out of a cave into the sunlight and your eyes are then going to be exposed to all this light that pupil is going to contract. So the iris is actually causing that opening the pupil to get very, very small. You turn around and you go back into the cave where it's dark and your iris is going to relax and it's going to allow that pupil to dilate and expand to, to let more light in. So through the pupil then is going to hit the lens. The lens is what's going to focus it and then project it backwards through the vitreous humor and it's going to then hit the retina. The retina, remember, is where we have those optic sensors, which are going to then convert that to a signal to be transferred down through the optic nerve, uh, then back to the optic chiasm, the thalamus, and then ultimately the visual cortex. We're not gonna be talking uh, much about the brain aspect of the pathway of light in this, cha in this chapter. We're gonna stick to uh, just the basic eye components. Turning your attention to page 520, we see the combining forms of the eye chart. This is going to be that go-to chart for you in this chapter. So I would put a bookmark on the combining forms chart as well as that first chart where it discusses the anatomy because that's going to help you go back and forth as we are looking at the rest of these terms throughout the chapter. Some interesting terms here that you have to know in order to work your way through it, such as blepharo, meaning eyelid, conjunctive, that's pretty straightforward. We've heard that term used uh, out in public quite a bit as conjunctivitis for pink eye, so it's something that we are pretty familiar with. Cor, corio, and pupilo all refer to the pupil. Corneo or corrado refer to the cornea, of course. A dacra, a lacrim are both for the tear ducts, irido or iro for iris, and then oculo or ophthalmo for vision, for the eye in general, opt specifically, opta with the T there, opt meaning vision, and then fake, phaco or phaco, uh, either with the C or with the K, talking about the lens of the eye, retino for obviously the retina and then sclera or sclero for the sclera of the eye. Now one thing I want to point out here is when we're looking at that term ophthalmo, 
Notice how I'm pronouncing it, ophthalmo. So I'm really putting an emphasis on the PH, making that F sound. It is oftentimes where most people will, will pronounce it ophthalmo. So they'll actually pronounce the P, but the P is silent when it's combined with that H, so it actually makes the F sound ophthalmo. So when we start looking at this used in different terms, remember that, that when you see that O-P-H, T-H, ophthal, ophthalmo is how we're going to pronounce that. So such as in the term ophthalmology, as it's pointed out here, it's really that O-F type of sound, O-P-H, ophthalmology. We are now looking at some combining forms commonly used with the eye. And we're not going to spend too much time on these combining forms here. This is page 522, and then we're going to see the prefixes on 523 and the suffixes as well. Because we're going to be looking at using these terms when it comes to the disease and disorder terms. We're not going to spend a whole lot of time here, but just think cryo as in cold, diplo as in two, iso meaning equal, photo meaning light, and ton meaning pressure. When we get to the prefixes, again, we see just the bi or the bind, like in binary for meaning two, once again. And then suffixes, opia, meaning vision or a condition of the vision. Phobia, most people are familiar with that in that it's something that you're scared of, like an irrational fear of something. And then plegia, we've heard that before regarding to a paralysis. So now we're on page 524 and we're gonna start looking at some of the disease and disorder terms. There are quite a few of these. So I'm gonna just point out a few of them. I'm not gonna go through the entire list, but remember we uh, just looked at that term blepharo or that combining form blepharo, and here we see it as blepharitis, which is meaning an inflammation of the eyelid. Remember that blepharo means the eyelid, and then we have an inflammation. And here we see a picture, and this is one of the exercises in your text of an inflamed eyelid, which is then actually sort of crusting up because of the secretions that were formed around it. So in this case, you'd have some type of infection in the eye causing the eyelid to swell, and then you're getting the sort of crusty or goopy eyelids. Blepharotosis, again, the blepharo meaning the eyelid, but then the tosis, if you remember from previous chapters, meaning drooping. So here we see that we have a drooping eyelid. This image here is of dacrocystitis. So dacro meaning, again, that tear duct, the dacro combining form. And then the cystitis, we have an inflammation of that dacro gland or of that tear duct gland. Conjunctivitis, this one is probably the most popular that you're going to see. This is where you've got that inflamed conjunctiva and so therefore it becomes reddened, and that's where we get sort of the red eye or the pink eye, and that's commonly then known as conjunctivitis or pink eye. This is really common in preschools and elementary schools because kids will get some type of pathogen on their hands, and then they're constantly touching their face and rubbing their eyes, and then not cleaning their hands, touching some other child, or the other child is touching a toy that the previous infected child had touched, then they touch their eyes, and pretty soon everybody in the daycare has pink eye because they're spreading this infection around via contact with their hands and then touching their face. So those are the main uh, disease and disorder terms that are pretty common. I'm not going to go through the entire list here. You can see those listed as well as the ones on the right side of the list. This list is continued onto page 525 as well. One thing I will point out on this page is the retinopathy. And we see this a lot in diabetics, and diabetes is a huge issue in the United States, as well as around the world, medically. And if it goes untreated, we can get what's called diabetic retinopathy. Retinopathy in itself is just a generalized term for any type of disease state or pathology of the eye or of the retina, and specifically a non-inflammatory disease state. And in diabetics specifically, then what we're seeing is what's pointed out in this image as these cotton wool spots. So essentially within the vitreous humor of the eye and affecting the retina then, you've got all of these different little spots within the eye that's causing problems. Oftentimes a diabetic patient, when they have really high blood 
glucose levels and perhaps they've not realized that they're diabetic yet, they'll start to have really blurred vision and start seeing some spots and, and really have some troubles. And so they might go to an ophthalmologist in order to have their eyes checked out because they think that they need glasses or they're for some, some reason they're having blurry vision. And it turns out that perhaps they are also have diabetes and that's what's causing the blurry vision. That's different than diabetic retinopathy, but uh, also something to just good to know about the workup for a diabetic patient. The blurry vision is part of that. Flipping over to page 528 and 529, we see lots of different disease and disorder terms. These ones are not built from word parts, so you're just going to have to memorize these as you see them and use them. Again, here there's a lot of them, so we're not going to go through all of them, but I'm going to show you some pictures of some common ones. Here is a gentleman with a cataract, so you can see in his right eye. Now, as you're looking at the screen, it looks like, oh, well, but that's on my left. Remember, that's your left. That's not anatomical left. And whenever we are discussing patients, we're going to use anatomical direction. So in this case, this is the patient's right eye that we see a really severe cataract. Now, you won't always see them to be this severe, uh, but in this case, this is a good example so that you understand exactly what it is. Here is a calaison, and the calaison is basically just an obstruction of an oil gland that is in the eyelid. Now, remember going all the way back to the anatomical section, we talked about the myobium glands, and so this would also be considered to be a myobium cyst because it's in that oil gland of the eyelid. Here we have an image of the detached retina, and you can see that the graphic here is showing the, the choroid layer as well as the retinal layer, but the retina is not attached to the choroid layer here down at the bottom like it is up on top. You can see up on top, this is how it should look for a fully attached retina, but down here, the retina became detached. This can happen for uh, quite a number of reasons, including trauma, and we'll talk about that just a little bit more, as well as how to fix this when we get to the surgical procedures section of the chapter. Glaucoma is a term that means high pressure in the eye. And so we can see here on this graphic several different types of glaucoma that are being illustrated, including an inflammatory glaucoma. So an inflammation of the eye is causing increased pressure or a neovascular glaucoma. Remember, neo meaning like genesis or new, and then vascular meaning veins or blood vessels. So new blood vessels, new circuitry of those blood vessels in your eye is causing an increased pressure. And then traumatic glaucoma is the last one over here on the right when you have some type of trauma to the head, such as in a motor vehicle accident or in physical abuse trauma, then you would actually have some swelling with inside of the eye causing increased pressure. Macular degeneration, which is the last term there on the left slide, we can see different types of macular degeneration and the ARMD just means age-related macular degeneration. Sometimes it's called ARMD, sometimes it's just called AMD or MD. Uh, but in any case, it's, it's a macular degeneration. With dry AMD, you've got what's called drusen, which is just the blood vessels here that have become dried up and brittle, and it kind of deposits itself as what is known as drusen. And so then it's causing a degenerative state of the macula because of that blood vessel that is no longer functioning the way it's supposed to. And then in wet, macular degeneration, you actually have an abnormal proliferation of the blood vessels. And so you have lots of extra blood and fluid in that macular area, which is causing the degeneration. And because you've got the blood or the fluid, that's why they call that wet. Whereas the dry is because it's brittle and dried up vessels that actually aren't supplying the eye with the nutrients and the blood that it needs any longer. So that's the difference between the wet and the dry. And then this image here is just showing what can sometimes be seen with macular degeneration to one extent or another, depending on where in the macula you've got the degeneration, you're going to start to see these black spots within your field of vision. These spots are not going to be floating around or moving. So anytime you like sort of see a floater or something like that doesn't necessarily mean you've got macular degeneration or anything like that. Sometimes some of those are common and normal for us to have. But in macular degeneration, you're going to see that very significant black spot start to 
be noticeable and it's going to it's going to tend to stay in that same area. So now let's look over at the right hand side of this list. Uh, just a few terms to point out over here. The first one is this nystagmus. It's the third one down on the list. And here you can see a video that is showing a patient with nystagmus. And so what they're doing is they're looking away and then they look back at the camera and you can see how their eye is kind of just jittering back and forth. That's the nystagmus. So when that eye just sits there and kind of moves a little bit, that's what's called a nystagmus. Sometimes the patient themselves, because their brain is actually processing the movement of that eye, that jittering, and it's telling the head then to move with the eye. So a lot of times this patient might sit there and look like this as they're talking to you or doing their work. And it's because their eye would be, is jittering, so they've got to move their head in order to, to maintain focus on what they're looking at. So a lot of times you might walk up to this person and ask them a question and they're saying, yeah, that's absolutely right. And, and they're, they're kind of shaking their head. It's going to be something that's prolonged and continuous. And it's actually part of what's called the nystagmus. This next picture is of strabismus. And strabismus is just sort of the fancy medical term for being cross-eyed. So here we can see that this patient's right eye is normal, focused forward at the camera but their left eye is being crossed. It's actually facing inward or medial to the patient. Here's another image. This one's not quite as bad, but it's still uh, pretty significant that you can notice it. And then here's a pretty severe one in the opposite direction of that first image we looked at. All of these would be um, strabismus. Here is a sty. A sty is pretty common. Lots of people have heard of this or have even had them. And typically it's just sort of that inflamed red part of your eyelid, that lower eyelid. And it's caused by an infection of an oil gland. So again, something is getting into your eye, usually from contact or rubbing your eyes after you've gotten it on your hands and it's getting infected then. So you've got these glands in the upper eyelids, the lower eyelids, as well as the tear ducts. So the, the lacrimal ducts, you're all this opportunity for those to get infected and then to cause problems. And then we skipped over a few terms such as myopia or myopic and hyperopia or hyperopic and then and astigmatism. Those are all in this list, but I wanted to cover them together because we have this nice image here from our text which discusses them. Myopic or myopia basically just means nearsightedness. And you can see what's happening as the light comes through the cornea and then through the lens. It's getting focused, but it's getting focused improperly. It's not actually focusing on the retina where it should, it's focusing before the retina. And so this myopia is called nearsightedness. Hyperopia then, or hyperopic, that's the opposite. Again, we're focusing lights coming through the cornea, through the lens, but then it's focusing on a point behind the retina. So that's called farsightedness. And then with astigmatism, you've just got a combination of out of focus points that it's just not hitting the retina the way it should be. And so it's kind of bouncing all over the place. Think of this as if you're taking a picture with your camera and you take the picture and it's all blurry. Well, the image that you wanted to be in focus, if the image is my hand, but the camera was focusing here in front of it, then the hand's going to be blurry. And if the camera's trying to focus back here, then again, the hand is going to be blurry. Only if it's focusing on the hand itself, are we going to get good, clear vision. And that's what we see then with myopia or hyperopia. And this is really common. This is why people wear contact lenses or glasses in order to correct their vision. Jumping over to page 532, we see surgical terms built from word parts. Here, not going to spend too much time because we've seen a lot of these words already. We're seeing a lot of the otomies and ectomies. And then we're just adding them to our combining forms. So the blepharo, remember that meant the eyelid. The cryo, that's that super cold or freezing aspect of it. So the cryo retinopexy is actually a surgical fixation using extreme cold and they use carbon dioxide in order to do that. But that's where that term cryo comes in that we saw in the prefix slide. The dacro, remember the dacro referring back to the tear ducts or lacrimal ducts. And then we see the rhinostomy 
aspect of that. So dacrocystorhinostomy. Here we can break this up into several different sections. We've got the dacro, we've got the cysto, the rhino, and then the ostomy. Now note that, again, lots of combining forms in there that are sharing some of the vowels, some of those combining vowels. So the dacrocystorhinostomy would just be an artificial creation of a drainage. So when we have problems with our tear ducts or lacrimal ducts, then this procedure is going to help to drain that. Some that might be a little bit more common due to, to trauma mainly would be like a keratoplasty or keratoplasty, which would be the surgical repair of the cornea or the corneal transplant, as it's more commonly called, and then a sclerotomy, which is just an incision into the sclera itself. Some other surgical terms, just going to uh, make mention of the ones here that you've probably heard this LASIK. So you all have probably heard of LASIK surgery or LASIK eye surgery. So in this case, the, the LASIK is just a laser assisted surgery in order to reshape the corneal tissue uh, in order to help improve the patient's vision. And then FACO or the full term is FACO emulsification, often times just uh, referred to as FACO is a cataracts procedure where they're going in and removing the cataract of the patient. Scleral buckling is that procedure where we are going to reattach a detached retina. So here we see that figure of the detached retina once again. And then over here on the right hand side of the image, we see a encircling band. And it is actually then being placed there in order to help keep that retina attached along with this silicone exoplant that's helping to keep that retina connected to the choroid. Diagnostic terms built from word parts is our next section, and this is probably one that most people are going to be the most familiar with because they go to the eye doctor and they're getting their eyes checked. And so this would be the, the diagnostic component of optometry. So then at the eye doctor's office, you're going to have that evaluation. You're gonna see lots of scopes, and scopies, as we see here all the way through, we see the term ophthalm. So again, referring back to that, that F sound, ophthalmoscopy, ophthalmoscope, and then optometry or optometrist, specifically talking about the eye doctor himself or the study of the eye. Other terms down here like the tonometer or tonometry, remember, again, going back to that prefix chart, we know that that means pressure. So when we're looking at glaucoma, for example, and we're testing out the pressure in someone's eye, then we're looking at a tonometer or a tonometer, and that would be tonometry is, is the actual process of doing that and studying that. Uh, most everybody is familiar with the ophthalmoscope. So ophthalmoscope is on that list that we looked at and, and here it is in the caregiver's hands and they're just looking into the patient's eye in order to see how it responds to light as well as to get a sort of microscopic view inside of the eye to see if there's anything that is abnormal that would be causing the vision problems that the patient is having. Moving on to some complementary terms built from the word parts. We see a lot of items here that are pretty familiar such as binocular, again the bi meaning two and, and ocular, so double vision. So referring to both eyes, so by an eye, by binocular. And then we see familiar terms like corneal, intraocular, so they're within or inside the eye, lacrimal, nasal lacrimal, so again, nasal lacrimal duct, so that area there between the, the nose and the lacrimal duct. Ophthalmic, again, there we see that PH making that F sound, which is just uh, meaning pertaining to the eye. And then we see the ophthalmologist and ophthalmology. The ophthalmologist is that physician who studies and treats the diseases of the eye. And then ophthalmopathy pertaining to a disease of the eye. Optic relating to vision in itself, uh, pseudophakia, pseudo meaning fake, and then <laughs> fakia, the fake um, aspect meaning to the lens. So it's kind of an interesting word because you've got the word fakia in it with the P-H-A-K-I-A, -A, but that actually pertains to the lens. And the fake, actually the fake lens, the fake aspect of that is the pseudo part of the word. So pseudo meaning fake, fakia meaning lens, pseudo fakia. You kind of have a fake fakia if you were to miscombine those two words. 
And then pupillary and retinal, of course, pertaining to the pupil and the retina. Now note that as we continue to go through complementary terms in here, these are not built from word parts. We have the optometrist. The optometrist, do not confuse that with the ophthalmologist. The ophthalmologist is the actual physician who is studying and treating the diseased components of the eye. The optometrist usually is, but may not always be a physician. The optometrist then is a health professional who is prescribing the corrective lenses for you. So either a, a contact or eyeglasses. Don't confuse those two. It's easy to see that if you're going to the optometrist, you're going to get eyeglasses or to get corrective lenses or contacts. If you're going to the ophthalmologist, you're going to the eye doctor specifically. And then right above optometrist, you see optician. The optician is that healthcare provider who's actually then just filling the prescription from the optometrist for your eyeglasses. So oftentimes you may end up at an ophthalmologist having your eyes evaluated. They send you to an optometrist. The optometrist prescribes you the type of lens that you'll need. And then the optician will actually fill that prescription. So imagine going to your hospital clinic and you see the doctor, the doctor evaluates you and writes a prescription. And then you go to the pharmacy. There's a pharmacist there who is making sure everything is proper with the prescription. And then there might be a pharmacy technician who actually fills the prescription for you all under the supervision of the pharmacist and the medical doctor. So similarly here we have an ophthalmologist and then we have the optometrist and the optician. And then finally we get to page 544 where we have our abbreviations and we've seen most of these as we've worked through such as the macular degeneration, AST short for astigmatism, which we uh, looked at already. IOL such as intraocular lens, the ophth, remember the ophth, such as ophthalmology. So that's just short for ophthalmology. And then FACO we discussed a VA meaning visual acuity and I skipped EM up here just to be complete here that means emetropia. All right that finishes up the chapter on the eye chapter 12 in medical terminology. Next we'll be moving over to the ear in chapter 13 so go ahead and look for that video and we'll see you over there.